Hello and welcome to our unit on the nucleus here in Honors Chemistry. And uh, before we get too far into it, let's go back to that organizational Prezi and just see how we've got the entire course laid out, see where we've been and where we're going. And then we'll come right back in and we'll start talking about things at the atomic level, which is pretty cool and is a big deal in chemistry. So here it is again. And uh, remember, you can always go and play around with this Prezi whenever you want. But remember that our overall theme for the year is that matter is made of atoms that interact in interesting ways. And in Unit 2 and 3, we were dealing with large amounts of matter. We were looking at phases of matter and phase changes and gas laws. And that was really cool. But now we're actually going to go in and we're going to look at individual units of matter, which of course are atoms. And so here's our model of an atom. And Unit 4 and Unit 5 together are both going to deal with the atom. And so let's go in and take a look at the nucleus. So this is the center of the atom. And we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about how that's laid out. And then we're going to look at the various applications that have been developed that take advantage of the nucleus, particularly over the last hundred years or so in human history. We're really going to start talking about nuclear power and nuclear weapons and all of the cool nuclear chemistry that's really been developed over the last 100 years. So, uh, yeah, let's go back to the presentation. And let's start talking about the nucleus. So before we get too far into the nucleus and how it works, we're actually just going to take a one little brief step back and just talk about overall atomic structure. Very, very basic kind of introduction to what atoms are made of and how they function. So for a long time, it was thought that atoms were in fact the smallest unit of matter. And that's actually what the name means, right? Atom comes from the Greek atomos, which just means indivisible. It's probably a good idea to start thinking about just how tiny atoms are. So here's one little quick little fact for you. One gram of hydrogen gas contains this many atoms of hydrogen gas. So 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of hydrogen, which is an incredibly, incredibly large number of atoms. If you remember back to our discussion about Avogadro's hypothesis from last unit. This is what we call a mole of atoms. And you can start to understand why we want to use moles when we talk about atoms, because they're just so tiny that it's really impossible to talk about individual atoms in any meaningful way. So there's a model of an atom right above me here, and you see this model of um, just some sort of standardized atom. And you can see that this is not to scale. So the nucleus is taken to be 10 to the negative 15 meters, and then the dimensions of the rest of the atom is 10 to the negative 10 meters. We'll talk again about why that isn't to scale and what we could think about to scale it at the end of this lesson. But we just want to start talking about the things that we see inside of atoms. We actually do have the technology these days to visualize individual atoms. So this image over here is actually individual gold atoms that have been uh, visualized using an atomic force microscope, which is a device that can actually feel the electron clouds put out by different atoms and can represent them basically as tiny blurry spheres. Uh, so it's really neat that we actually can see individual atoms. Uh, when I was a kid, I was taught that we actually couldn't see individual atoms, which is basically a lie at this point. Uh, we have a way to visualize individual atoms in certain circumstances but you really kind of lose your perspective when you talk about individual atoms and you're just looking at blurry little spheres so we're going to get a little bit below that to the level of the theoretical and talk about the things that we see going on inside of atoms so it turns out that atoms are not actually indivisible atoms are actually composed of three major subatomic particles and so these are our protons our neutrons and our electrons Protons and neutrons are both located in the nucleus of the atom, so they're together referred to as an atom's nucleons. Electrons are not located in the nucleus of the atom. They're actually located outside of the nucleus in a region called the electron cloud. If we look at the other characteristics of these three subatomic particles, we're mostly interested in their mass. So protons and neutrons both have approximately the same mass. We give it a mass of one AMU, or atomic mass unit. And electrons have an incredibly small mass, so small that we can consider it to be functionally negligible. But I put it up here for you. It's 0 .00054 AMUs, or roughly 1 1836th of the mass of a proton or a neutron. And of course, we're also interested in their charge. So protons are taken to have a charge of positive one, and neutrons are taken can have no charge at all, they're neutral, and electrons are taken to have a charge of negative one. So protons and electrons have opposite but equal charges, and protons and neutrons have equal or at least approximately equal masses, but that's pretty much the only similarities that we see when we look at these different particles.
And of course, these particles are made up of even smaller particles, combinations of particles that are called quarks. We don't need to worry about that in this class, but it is something that you should be aware of and something that you'll learn a lot more about next year when you take physics. So we're going to go through each of the three subatomic particles in turn, just really quickly, a brief introduction. We'll spend a lot more time dealing with each of them over the course of the next units and throughout the rest of the year. But we're going to start with the electron because it was discovered first. It was discovered by J.J. Thompson, who is an English chemist in the late 80s. 1800s and they are of course located outside of the nucleus and we'll see how that led to their initial discovery so it turns out that every atom that is electrically neutral has to have an equal number of protons and electrons and that probably makes sense to you if the protons all have positive charges there has to be an equal number of electrons to offset that positive charge and balance it out to bring it back towards neutral However, atoms can exchange electrons, and this is kind of interesting. This is really the only subatomic particle that atoms can exchange among themselves. And so once we finish talking about the structure of the individual atom over the next couple of units, we're going to move in and actually start looking at the exchange of electrons over the rest of the course, and that's what we call bonds, something that I'm pretty sure you've had some exposure to before our conversation right now. Protons were discovered by Ernest Rutherford, second. They were discovered in the uh, very early part of the 20th century. And unlike electrons, which can be exchanged between individual atoms and making bonds, atoms really cannot exchange their protons. The number of protons that an atom has is very characteristic of that particular atom. That's what we call that atom's atomic number. And without getting too much into the periodic table currently, that's how all of the elements are arranged on the modern periodic table in order of increasing atomic number. Because that number of protons really is characteristic of individual elements. If you change the number of protons, you're no longer talking about the same element. Sometimes you might get questions about the nuclear charge of an atom. And so if you think about the nucleus, the nucleus just has the nucleons in it, the protons and neutrons. Neutrons, as we discussed before, have no charge at all, and protons have a positive charge. So for every positively charged proton in the nucleus, that's going to increase the charge of the nucleus by plus one. So if we consider any particular atom, let's say an atom with six protons in it, its nuclear charge is going to be plus six one for each of those protons. It's really important to understand that with nuclear charge, it's always a positive value. In a neutral atom, that's going to be balanced out by the negative charge from the electron cloud. And last, but certainly not least, are the neutrons, only put here last because they were discovered last by James Chadwick in the 1940s. Neutrons are pretty cool. They contribute to an atom's mass as much as protons do, and they're found in the nucleus of the atom, but they do not have any charge at all. So when we actually figure out the mass of individual atoms, we have to do that by summing the total number of protons and neutrons in that atomic nucleus in order to figure out the overall mass of the individual atom. Unlike protons, atoms of the same element can have different numbers of neutrons. These are what we call isotopes. So isotopes are just atoms of the same element. In other words, they have the same number of protons or the same atomic number, but they have different numbers of neutrons. As we come back to this notion of the atom here at the end of this discussion, it's probably a good idea to start to think about how you could put all of these things in a scale that makes sense to you. As we discussed in this model that I used earlier, it's not drawn to scale because if you wanted to draw it to scale, you wouldn't actually be able to visualize the individual nucleus. And so this becomes problematic because how are you gonna be able to represent these things in a way that makes sense? Here's an example that I came across recently. So if you think about the atom as having a diameter of a football field, the nucleus in that atom would take up the same amount of space as one individual blueberry sort of suspended in the middle of that football field. Those are two scales that we have some handle on, and so I think it's not a bad idea to put this example in your head. Of course, we're never actually going to be representing atoms to scale because it's just impractical for our purpose. We'll always represent the nucleus much larger than it is in reality, and we'll always represent the electrons much closer to the nucleus than they are in reality. This is a really good time to start talking about the periodic table. We're gonna spend a lot more time talking about the periodic table as this course moves on, but the periodic table is fantastic. It's probably one of the first and probably the best infographics ever developed by the human species. There's just so much information in this little tiny chart that can fit on the front of your t-shirt without a problem. You have a copy of your periodic table in your reference tables, and I've actually isolated the key from the periodic table, which I've just pasted here into the slide, so you can see what all the different parts 
of an element's listing on the periodic table are. The periodic table is going to cover things like the number of protons in the atom. We can figure out the number of neutrons and the number of electrons and the charge of the atom all on this periodic table, which is really, really useful as we go forward. So I thought maybe here at the end, we could spend some time looking at a periodic table entry and trying to answer a whole bunch of questions related to it based on what we've just talked about. Let's see if we can do that. So this is the periodic table entry for carbon. You're going to find that I really like carbon a lot, and I'm going to keep coming back to carbon as sort of our go-to example throughout the year because I just think it's a great element. It's probably my favorite element. And so there's a whole bunch of things that we can get off of carbon's periodic table entry. And here are the questions that I'd like you to try to answer. So pause the video, jot down answers to each of these questions, and then when you're ready, let it play, and let's go through the answers to each of them. Cool, so let's start from the top. So carbon has six protons, and we know this because the atomic number for carbon is six. The atomic number for carbon is just the number of protons that it has. Since there are just six protons in the nucleus, that means that the nuclear charge is going to be positive six. And that means that if we were to add up all of those protons together, they would have a mass of six atomic mass units. If we want to figure out how many electrons carbon has when it's neutrally charged, it's going to have an equal number of electrons to its number of protons, so that's going to be 6 again. And we actually see this down at the bottom. We have the electron configuration, which is 2-4. We don't really know how to interpret that yet, but if we add up 2 and 4, we get to 6. The most common isotope of carbon is going to be carbon-12, and we're going to talk a lot more about that in our next discussion. And if we wanted to figure out the number of neutrons in the most common isotope of carbon, or carbon-12, we would just take that mass of 12 and subtract 6 from it to get 6 neutrons. I hope that these made sense. If they don't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have, and then when you're ready, we can go and wrap up. Thanks so much for watching this video. Let's take a moment and make sure that you can do the following here at the end. Make sure that you can demonstrate your understanding of the mass, the location, and the charge of protons, neutrons, and electrons in an atom. Make sure that you can determine the nuclear charge of an atom. Also make sure that you can use the periodic table to determine the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in an atom. If you can do each of those things, you're doing great. If not, take a moment, write down any questions that you have. You can always get in touch with me by leaving comments below the video or through the information in the info field. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.